Hi there, my name is Jason Stankevich, and I'm currently a second year pulmonary and critical care fellow at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. You're all back for more. Today, we'll continue our journey on the road to becoming those mini experts within the field of nicotine use treatment. And as a means to help liberate our patients from nicotine addiction, this series will focus on nicotine biology. These images link the core topics we'll cover today. In particular, we'll continue just where we left off. We'll follow nicotine from those delivery systems that we covered as they get absorbed by a patient, manipulated by the patient's body and system, and how nicotine itself may manipulate the patient, both at a cellular and at a behavioral level, all as a means to better appreciate this intricate interplay and be equipped to intervene on addiction. These are the key learning objectives for today, which include, one, reviewing the history and interactions of humans and nicotine, two, reviewing the pharmacokinetics of nicotine, and three, reviewing the pharmacodynamics and subsequent behavioral effects of nicotine. Nicotine. Of all those components we reviewed, as we'll see, it's nicotine that's a bad guy. It's nicotine that's a major psychoactive compound within cigarette smoke and other delivery systems. This is the culprit in addiction, and we need to understand it. Nicotine is named after the French ambassador to Portugal, who introduced tobacco to France in the 1500s as snuff. But to ask a philosophical or a teleological question, why does it exist? Who knows? But naturally, nicotine is an insecticide found in several plants of the nightshade family, including tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, and of course the tobacco plant. At a molecular level, depicted here, we see the obligatory nod to organic chemistry, a class that hopefully we all passed, but... As we believe it or not, the structure is important. Nicotine is within the family of the alkaloids. Nicotine is a molecule. It's highly influenced by pH, and its pH will dictate its proton status and charge, and hence how readily it will enter our bloodstream and our brain barriers. Now, let's take a look at the pharmacokinetics of nicotine, or what the body does to the compound, starting with absorption. As nicotine is carried from the solid phase of smoke or vape, it enters into our airways and gets to the level of the alveoli. There are several explanations why nicotine is so readily absorbed via the lungs, and recall that proposed bioavailability of about 80 to 100%. One, as a collective system, we're reminded of the awesome surface area network that the alveoli possess and allow for absorption. Two, the relatively basic pH of the alveoli provides an environment for free base nicotine to predominate, which is more readily absorbed across membranes. On the same topic, and as a review, Ammonia as an additive may theoretically allow for more nicotine-free base form to exist and hence be more readily absorbed at this higher pH. After being absorbed from the alveoli, there is no first-pass metabolism. That is, nicotine is absorbed from the inhaled route to the pulmonary veins, to the left ventricle, to the systemic blood flow, and to the brain, where the predominant effects occur. What I'd like to highlight is how rapidly and efficiently nicotine is absorbed via the inhalational route. Specifically, it has been shown that nicotine is absorbed in about 10 to 20 seconds. That is, nicotine bloodstream levels and nicotine is available to the central nervous system in about 10 to 20 seconds from when someone takes a puff of that cigarette, even coming close to IV administration. With this rapid rise in response to behavior, such as putting that cigarette to the mouth, we can see how easy it is for smokers to self-titrate to the desired effects and for there to be a direct correlation between behavior such as smoking and psychoactive reinforcement. Here's a graph by Benowitz and colleagues that focuses on nicotine blood levels over time for various nicotine products. A few points. Focusing on the nicotine in the top left box, we see how rapidly peak levels are achieved as indicated by that sharp uptick. Comparing cigarettes to other forms of nicotine, such as gum, lozenge, patch, we see that these other forms allow for the slow, gradual elevation of nicotine, eliminating that direct effect into the addictive nature of the cigarette, really laying the foundation for nicotine replacement therapy. Although there's a rapid rise in nicotine levels, smokers actually experience a relatively steady state of nicotine for about 24 hours or so. After absorbed, nicotine ends up pretty much everywhere, the liver, the kidney, the spleen, the lungs. However, the highest affinity is really in the brain, which accounts for those important behavioral effects. Additionally, nicotine is found in gastric juice, saliva, breast milk, and also the blood placental barrier. These PET CT images by Gard and colleagues show healthy individuals injected with radio-traced nicotine. We see in the top images, in the early phase, organs that accumulate nicotine include the brain, the liver, the spleen, the lungs, and the kidney. In the later phases, in the bottom, 
Some of that nicotine remains in those organs, but not as intensely. The bulk is found in the bladder thereafter. This segues nicely into the metabolism and elimination portions of pharmacokinetics. Please take a look at this slide and memorize it. Please don't. When nicotine enters our system, it's metabolized as several components, and the most notable metabolite is cotinine, highlighted in blue. Also, the most predominant enzyme in this process is CYP2A6 enzyme. You may or may not know, but cotinine is widely used as a measurable metabolite to document abstinence, or not-so-abstinence. The metabolite is uniquely set up for this analysis as nicotine's half-life is about 2 hours versus cotinine about 16 and a half hours. However, at current absolute thresholds are not set for measuring. At the end of the day, when nicotine is run through our system, about 90% of nicotine is absorbed and accounted for by nicotine in the urine or a metabolite within the urine excreted by the kidney. This is the set system, but different individuals may clear nicotine less than others, with variables including age, female sex, pregnancy, OCPs, renal failure, along with the additive menthol. As revisited as a flavor additive to help smooth the effects of nicotine, there's some data to suggest that menthol additive slows down the metabolism of nicotine via slower oxidative and glucuronide conjugation. So why are we so worried about it? What happens when nicotine rapidly enters our blood-brain barrier within those few seconds? At the molecular level, nicotine binds to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, depicted on the slide. These receptors are ligand-gated channels. So when the receptor's ligand, in this case nicotine, is present, the channels open and allow for influx of positively charged ions, namely sodium and calcium. Downstream to this ion influx, there's depolarization and changes in neurotransmitter concentrations with drive behavioral effects. There are different subsets or flavors of nicotine receptors consisting of different makeups of the alpha and beta subunits. Each of these subtypes are more or less predominant in certain regions. The most notable type present in the brain are the alpha-4, beta-2 subtypes. There are, however, certain regions of the brain where nicotine receptors are more prominent than others. This is your brain on nicotine. This is what happens downstream once nicotine as a ligand attaches to its receptors. Note that most of these activities occur at the presynaptic level. As nicotine binds, there's usually an increase in neurotransmitters as listed here, notably dopamine, among others. What exactly those concentrations of dopamine do in terms of behavioral effects and addiction are important, and we'll soon follow this up. What's fascinating is the possibility that cigarette smoke, independent of nicotine, may also have psychoactive properties, including addiction. As noted, there will be several regions in the brain where nicotine receptors are more predominant and important. Of these regions, one of the most important to cover is the mesolimbic system, which is very tightly related to addiction. Normally, in general, the mesolimbic system serves a very basic and instinctual role. It supplies our drive to survive. It is responsible for creating and feeding the motivational drive with rewarding certain behaviors that lead to survival, Additionally, it provides the necessary reinforcement to produce cognitive states to overcome adversities in our goal to survive and succeed. I'd venture to say that we all had a relatively active mesolimbic system during our step one or equivalent test studying. This network in our brains as a system consists of different types and projections of neurons. Some of these projections include talk between the ventral tegmental area or the VTA found in our midbrain to other portions of the brain that include the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, the hippocampus. One very highly studied projection in this system is highlighted in the image, and that is of the VTA to the nucleus accumbens, which again is tightly linked to reward and addiction. Notably, most of the neurons here use dopamine as its neurotransmitter. Normally, the VTA responds favorably with positive signals, signals including sex, food, friendship, safety, Twinkies, and as a result, the person is attracted to this activity and scenarios. The kicker, the real kicker here, is that the input to the VTA is mediated from the form of the nicotine receptor. As a result, we can see that nicotine, as an exogenous compound from cigarettes, from vaping, can lead to dopamine release, an activation of a very primitive center of the brain, responsible for that reward, that satisfaction, that sense of safety. Because of this hijacking, of this instinctual center of our brain, we can see how and why nicotine has such a great grasp on our patients. It creates that extremely powerful effect of a quote unquote incorrect safety signal. That lasting, nagging, persistent nature of this addiction is seen here. In addition, there are some proposed mechanisms as to why nicotine 
outlives the half-life of nicotine at the addiction level. After prolonged nicotine receptor activation, there's actually a phosphorylation of cyclic AMP, which activates an element binding protein, and it actually enhances gene activation. Another effect is on the delta FOS B, which is a transcription factor. Both of these examples show how addiction develops as a concretized form, hardwired in our patients' brains, and may actually point to why nicotine addiction has a so long-lasting, a roller coaster event, why it's characterized by relapses. Lastly, as some have proposed, because this nicotine addiction taps into the survival system and safety net system, it may seem even inhumane or not make sense to ask our patients for a quit date. So, we've inhaled the tobacco, the nicotine, the vape, and it has produced its immediate effect on our receptors. So now what happens? Generally, the psychoactive effects of nicotine is a potentially a positive one in the sense that it achieves a state of stimulation, arousal, happiness, as seen on the left here. Additionally, it may relieve some stress and anxiety along with the improving reaction time, task focus, and concentration. Conversely, on the right, we see a state of withdrawal. The state of withdrawal is important to note because it's important to be as open as possible with smokers in what they can experience upon quitting, and it helps us to understand why some of our pharmacotherapies may work. At the receptor level, withdrawal occurs after prolonged chronic nicotine use, and it produces neuroadaptation or changes that make difficult quitting. Primarily, the necessity for desensitization and upregulation of nicotine receptors following this prolonged exposure. Notably, the syndrome includes somatic findings, so the bradycardia, GI upset, increased appetite, cognitive findings, anhedonia, dysphoria, anxiety, irritability, difficulty concentrating, craving, affective findings. Some of these symptoms can be in as early as four hours, peak at three days, and can be noted within months from the last cigarette. Again, all of these findings will be helpful to understand how important it is to tackle this from multifactorial perspectives in managing patients. Lastly, beyond the purely psychoactive immediate effects of the drug, we must be aware of the importance that social cues play in continued nicotine addiction. Specifically, there are learned behaviors, certain contextual clues that will be more likely to make the smoker smoke more based on the situation. So there you have it, folks, a whirlwind tour of nicotine biology, which again, to recap, included the history and interactions of humans and nicotine with a focus on pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. I hope as a result of this brief discussion that we can begin to appreciate the deep-seated impact that nicotine has on addiction as it hijacks that reward system in our brains, which really gives insight into the nicotine addiction as one of trial, tribulation, and recurrence. I hope that this has provided an appreciation and maybe a further thirst to dig deeper into how we can put this background to use in the next session, which will focus on nicotine management in the office and the hospital. Thank you all again for your time for listening and stay tuned.